all your cooperation by taking your money out of the bank. And people need to kind of understand all the different ways that we're cooperating with the things that go on in our society. Um, and that's really what nonviolence is. There's a, a book that I read by Viktor Frankl, who was a survivor uh, of the Holocaust. He was a, um, uh, he became a, he was a psychologist and he started logotherapy, I think. But one of the things he's, he writes about how he survived um, from being in one of the concentration camps, one of the things that he says is between stimulus and response, there's a space. different than all the other animals in the world is that we have the ability to choose. We choose to how we respond, we choose whether we cooperate or not cooperate. But most of the time we're basically believing that we don't have that we don't have the choice. We don't have a choice. But everything that we do is a choice. And we just have to make the choices visible. That's kind of what nonviolence is about. Um, The person that I've read the when I first started when I was in, first became an activist in the early 80s, there wasn't a whole lot of information about nonviolence. You know, people wrote about peace, uh, peaceful nonviolence or philosophy, but they didn't write about nonviolence as a way of fighting. And Gene Sharp, uh, he wrote a book called *The Politics of Nonviolent Action*. He's a professor from he's a like professor from Harvard. I was at a did a week long workshop with him. Um, he basically developed the theory of, of nonviolent struggle and how nonviolence works. And um, he broke it down into power and struggle, the methods of nonviolent action. There's 198 different methods that he broke down and explained how the different ways that people use nonviolence and then the dynamics for how nonviolence works. Um, and this is just kind of my notes from one of his books. Uh, our rulers depend on us. These are the different sources of the power that they have is authority, their legitimacy amongst the people, human resources, all the people that do the work that run the government and run all the institutions that make our society work, um, skills and knowledge, all the different things that are required to make everything else run it is required by, they require people to do it. Um, intangible factors like source like societal attitudes toward obedience and submission, which I think we're in very great abundance of, of on the obedience side, and then shared beliefs and ideologies, um, material resources that the society has, and finally sanctions, their ability to use violence to get coercion, to get people to do what they want them to do. Um, the thing to realize about all these sources of power is that they're all based on people. They're all either based on our beliefs or on people who do them or don't do them. And that's really where the power lies. Um, a ruler's power is determined by how much control they have over all these sources of power. Uh, conversely, the power of the people is determined by how independent each of these sources of power are. So that's the basic reality, like the framework of what, how you need to understand where power lies to develop a successful movement. It's kind of understanding how it works. Um, when you understand where power resides, uh, it doesn't seem very important because we just go about living our daily lives. But the things that happen start getting the people to think um, when their rights are taken away or denied. You know, that is happening all over our country now. When resources begin to be distributed unequally, that's what this whole protest is about. You know, 99% of the people have one third of the resources and wealth. Well, 1% of the people have two-thirds of the wealth of our society. Um, and we're finally waking up and saying, we don't want that anymore. We want a different kind of society. Harmful decisions begin affecting people either locally or throughout the society. Um, elections are tampered with. To me, it was a sign of how weak our democracy was when we had two elections that were questionable and the yeah. people didn't do anything about it. Yeah. So that's a sign of the weakness of our democracy. Um, or the military takes over or the country's invaded. So there's a lot of things that can happen that can get people to move. Um, 
what starts a movement is when some people express feelings that everyone shares but in an open way in society and what it starts doing is getting people to start to think um, much of the time we think we're alone in our dissatisfaction with what is happening around us uh, when someone is able to express their dissatisfaction in a way that many can relate to in a public way more people begin to join them so it's someone saying something that everyone else is feeling that's how the movement starts um, when, and then when more and more people join the movement then the movement has the ability to start making demands of the things that they want to have changed um, and the, when the group is large enough the, d the ruler has to determine whether they're going to accept the demands of the protesters or the movement or keep using the policies that the people don't want anymore um, when they decide to maintain policies that people don't want anymore, it's time to fight. Um, a lot of times people don't think of um, nonviolence as a way of fighting. They think of it as a passive thing, but to me, nonviolence is, is the best weapon that the people have throughout the world to fight with. Um, why, why not violent action? Um, th these are the consequences of violent action, and when, when it comes down to it's a time to fight, you only have two choices. You fight with violence or you fight with nonviolence. There isn't really any other choice except for remaining passive. Um, when people... The, the reality, and it's very real in our society, but in most societies, the reality is that the people are never going to have the weapons to match the weapons of the people they're fighting against. It's pretty self-evident. We have enough bombs to blow up the whole world. <coughs> So there really isn't any way that we could match our government's weapon, violent weapons with match their power that they have in, in violence. Um, the choice of violent weapons automatically, dramatically limits the number of people who will want to participate. So when you pick up guns, that means very, very few people are going to be a part of what your resistance is. Um, and this is just my perspective. I think it was a mistake for the people of Libya to go start using guns even though they've won their democracy isn't going to be theirs because they've relied basically on all these nato and the united states and all these other people to fight their battle for them and their victory isn't going to be much because they're always going to be under control um even if they don't the other thing about violence is even if the people don't participate non-involved citizens suffer the vast majority of the destruction and violent conflicts. Um, the reality is, since since World War II, I think it was the number of the percentage of casual, civilian casualties to military casualties has gone up and up and up over time. So most of the people killed in wars and, and hurt in wars are actual people. It isn't the military anymore. It's non-combatants. <coughs> so the people who suffer are the people who are who are the, you know the people who they say they're fighting for the people who end up suffering when it's when they when violence is used um, and the other aspect of when you're using violence basically you're fighting against people who are like you you're fighting against the military or you're fighting against the police and they're and they're um they're people they're people that's one of the one of the things that they're discussing up in Oakland now and in other places are you know are the police part of the 99 percent or are they part of the one percent because they're enforcing the law of the one percent but we'll get to why how that works out in a minute um, I'm on the second page under uh, why nonviolent why not violent action and then finally when you're using violence what you end up destroying is the society that you care about. Um, so there's a lots of different factors <coughs> that I think point out why we shouldn't use violence when we're fighting. When it comes down to fight, the best way to do it is nonviolent. So why nonviolent action? Uh, the simple fact is that the ruler, no matter how big the army or brutal the police, simply cannot make people do something that they have chosen not to do. They can torture them, they can kill them, but that still doesn't get something done that they want to have done. We got flyers. Is this, you guys having a meeting right now? It is a workshop on uh, nonviolent struggle. Yeah. How it works. Why it works. 
Your page? Yeah, page two, <coughs> down there at the bottom here. Yeah, get a third paragraph. Yeah, right here, where it says, why nonviolent action? Okay. Um, can you pass that back? When we use nonviolent action, those carrying out the, the violence, basically the police or the military that's enforcing the rule of the government, what they're forced to do when you're when you're remaining nonviolent is that they're because you're not being violent against them, they have to think about what they're doing. Usually military and police, they do things based on following orders, but their program basically to respond to violence. When you're not using violence, they don't have the justification for being violent against you. So what it causes is a dilemma in their mind. And um, it takes a while sometimes for it to happen, but what happens is eventually is that they start having to think about what they're doing and whether they can justify doing, you know, repressing people that aren't fighting against them. Um, the other important thing about nonviolent action is that just about everyone can participate. Uh, like I said before, there's 198 different methods of nonviolent action uh, that Gene Sharp has developed. Um, some of them require more sacrifice or more courage. Others are basic things like holding a sign out. This is a nonviolent action, holding a sign out here. So when you're using nonviolence, you can get the whole society to participate because there's lots of different ways that people can show their opposition. Um, if you're using violence, you know, the only option you have is to get a gun or a knife, a knife or whatever Weapon. form of resistance that you're using, using violence. Um, so if everyone can participate, you're going to have a broader, broader sense of peop, uh, scope of people who are, who are able to use nonviolence. And in the act of using nonviolence, they understand their power. So you're going to have a more democratic society resulting if, when and if, uh, if you win. And then finally, when you're using nonviolence, less of your society is going to get destroyed. So I think it's pretty clear that nonviolent resistance is the best way for the people to fight. Um, on the next page, this is basically how nonviolence works, is the next paragraph, how nonviolent action works. Um, when momentum starts <laughs> building, uh, a group of people are willing to take greater risks and take more public act, confrontational nonviolent action to challenge the rulers and show them that the issue is a serious one. So it takes, kind of like what was happening up in Oakland today, I, I didn't hear what happened, but when they were marching down to the shipyards to close down the docks, um, that was gonna be possibly a big confrontation or the thing that happened on Tuesday night last week. Um, confrontations are what get people thinking. And the important thing about a confrontation, what it does is, um, Basically, it creates a what Martin Luther King called a creative tension. And what happens when when people are willing to stand up and take a risk and risk their safety or maybe even their life, like it has happened a lot in the Middle East, in Syria and, and Egypt and a lot of other places. Um, when people are willing to take a risk like that, what it causes is there's a sorry, I'm like. What it does, it, it causes the rest of the society to make to choose which side they're on. What happens in our society, for the most part, is people go along and they don't have to choose. They can pretend that nothing's happening. They can ignore what's happening. But when someone, can you pass those back? <laughs> but when someone takes a takes a brave stand and and shows the rest of the people they don't have to be afraid. Um, what it does, it basically <laughs> makes the rest of the society choose which side they're on. Most of the time we drive around, we don't pay attention to what's going on, but um, at a point when someone's willing to risk their life and be beaten by the police or shot, um, this is why I think what's happening in Syria especially, they've been fighting for a long time. Every time you hear the news, 15, 20, 30, 50 people have been killed by the, by the military. But what happens there is, when they're killed the next day, more people come out into the streets. And what's happened is the government, the government in Syria can't, violence isn't, the people aren't afraid of the violence anymore. And eventually they're going to, they're going to win. And I think their democracy is going to be a lot stronger, whatever form it takes, because the people have had to suffer and stand up and be together so long. 
over in Syria, where Egypt, they kind of won um, relatively quickly, and they're um, having a lot of difficulties now. Um, when the resistance keeps the pressure up, so when, when more and more people start standing up and taking courageous actions, the police start the police start refusing to cooperate. If you're fighting against the military, the military people either stop, and it, ha it happened in Syria, I think, where the military started, some people dropped out of the military and started fighting against their own military because they, wouldn't, they couldn't do it to, the, to their people anymore. Um, the people who are running the government stop running the government. They find different ways to, to withdraw their cooperation. Um, have you guys heard about the resistance to the Nazis during World War II? Have you heard about any of those stories? The French resistance. Yeah, the French, but the non, I'm talking about the, the nonviolence. Yeah, in Denmark, what happened was they didn't have a military. The Germans invaded Denmark really easily and took over the country, but the king of Denmark and the whole people of, De of Denmark refused to cooperate with the Nazis. They didn't turn the Jews over. They slowed down their work. They wouldn't work in the munitions factories. They did all these different tactics to, to basically not cooperate with the Nazis, and it was very effective. There wasn't really a whole lot the Nazis could do about it. Um, well, me, can I interrupt on that point? Yeah. Um, it actually, the reason the uh, Denmark were able to get all five or get almost all six thousand Jews out of the country was because their efforts were so successful that a Nazi warned them that they were about to grab all the Jews. So yeah. that it's the nonviolence of their resistance pulled in people. Yeah, and it's it's hard to justify it. Um, there's another really cool, there's actually a movie that was made about it. It was called The Rosenstrasse Resistance. And the last group of Jews that were rounded up were uh, Jewish men that were married to German women. And because, basically because the women were so used to being oppressed in their society for being married to Jewish men, that they weren't afraid. They had a kind of more of a resistance stance in their in their heart and they didn't need to take crap any, from anybody when they took their husbands these women went out in front of the gestapo headquarters in berlin there's a movie called rosenstrasse and they basically demanded that they get their they wanted their husbands back and they stayed out there they took the machine guns out they threatened that they were going to kill them and the women wouldn't go home and because of the dynamics that that put into play because of the way nazi society was set up where the women were the highest part of society and they worship women and all that yeah. kind of stuff they couldn't go out and massacre all the women so what happened was they released their husbands after a number of days and these were these were the guy these their husbands were never taken away to concentration camps so it's a really there's lots of examples like that in our history where but we're not taught it and that's one of the problems with our the way that we're taught history um, another thing that happens if the resistance keeps up is that um, international pressure starts building up where governments around the world stop supporting them unless they're our friends like the United States is friends of so many dictatorships that it's really, really hard for us to get anything to do, take stands. Um, an example of where this sort of failed in, in South Africa. Um, the ANC and the liberation movement down there was a nonviolent movement until the Sharpeville massacre. And what happens a lot of times, especially back then when people didn't have a very good understanding of nonviolence, is um, people expected that when you use nonviolence, that the other side is going to be nice to you. And that isn't, nonviolence is just a different way of fighting. It, it, it isn't something that you can expect. In nonviolent struggles, historically, less people have been killed comparing similar struggles between violent struggles and nonviolent struggles but the reality is it's just a different way of fighting and using nonviolence doesn't mean the other side will be nice to you or, or not hurt you it just means it's just a different way of fighting so they misunderstood it and when Sharpeville happened and when they massacred a lot of the kids that were striking in a school they chose to use they went into the armed struggle and I, um, I think primarily I think just personally, I think it was because they didn't understand how nonviolence works. But we have a, a lot better understanding because of what I, what I was saying in the beginning. There's a lot more books now about how it works. There's a lot more historical 
examples of nonviolence. So people have a, a much better grounding in nonviolence now than, than we used to. Um, when you're <clears throat> one of the things that happens when you're using nonviolence is when nonviolence fails. If you're having a nonviolent struggle and it fails, what people say is nonviolence doesn't work because the struggle failed. The reality is is violent struggle fails all the time. And we don't compare them similarly. If nonviolence doesn't work this time, it doesn't mean nonviolence doesn't work. It means you did something wrong. And you just need to figure out what you did wrong to be successful. Um, the other problem with nonviolence is that when you win, most of the time, the people that you're fighting, the government or the people that you're fighting against don't admit it. Um, there's some examples in the United States. I was involved in the anti-nuclear power movement in the 80s. And all the big massive actions that were happening, we were protesting down at Diablo Canyon. Um, There's a big protest back in, in New England at Seabrook. The, the places where we were fighting, they went online. Diablo Canyon is online right now, producing power for a few more years. And Seabrook went online as well. Well, what happened was because the people protested and we raised the issue of, of nuclear power and how dangerous it was, they stopped basically saying that nuclear power plants were okay because what happened was we were the ones that were taking the, the financial risk for nuclear power. The industry would not accept the risk. The only way that they could do nuclear power was if the people, the society, took the risk of nuclear power plants and insured them. The power plants couldn't do it. The businesses didn't want to do it because it was too much of a risk, as we're seeing what's happening in Japan. But we never real the people that were involved in it didn't realize that we won. And we won because we stopped nuclear power. What happened was the power plant that we were protesting against went online. So we felt like we lost. But the reality was in the long run, we actually were victorious. But the problem with most nuclear uh, nonviolent movements is that we don't get how strong we are. We don't understand when we're victorious because we listen to what they're saying. Um, at the bottom of page three, uh, something the really interesting thing about nonviolence is the history of nonviolent in the history of nonviolence is basically it's happened and people have been successful and they had no idea what they were doing. The only reason why a vast majority of the people who used nonviolence were victorious was because they didn't have any alternative. They didn't have people who had, wrote books like Gene Sharp's written. He's written a book called From Dictator From Dictatorship to Democracy. It's up online now in an Acrobat file where anyone around the world can download this basically pamphlet about how to overthrow a dictator using nonviolence. There wasn't anything like that. They did it because they, they, want, they didn't have guns or they didn't want to use guns and they were victorious even though they didn't have the understanding that they had. I'm sorry, who? Gene, uh, who wrote the book? No, uh, who was victorious? There's been lots of examples. I, that's another class I'm going to teach, the I think, next okay. Wednesday is, is the history of nonviolence. But um, there's been a lot of examples where people won without having any theoretical understanding of it at all. They knew Gandhi did something and they didn't understand the weapon they, they were using, but they won because they knew that that was all they had to, they knew that was all they had. Um, uh, I saw a play about Cesar Chavez. Yeah. Um, he kind of quoted Gandhi often. He, yeah. He was, yeah, he was fighting for like farmers, or farmers' rights. Yeah, and the grapes and stuff. Um, there's no war college dedicated to developing the nonviolent, the theory of nonviolence. There are a lot of the things that go into war. There's nothing comparable for nonviolence. There's think tanks like smaller think tanks. They don't have any money hardly, but they're doing a lot of good work. Um, but even with all the little knowledge, nonviolence has been very successful over the over the past two or three hundred years. The, the problem is that we don't know about it. We're not taught about it because I don't know. Powers that be don't want to put it in the textbooks. Yeah. yeah. What does nonviolence mean? I mean, is anything that you do that's nonviolent nonviolence? No. The the kind of nonviolence I'm talking about is there's. Like civil disobedience? Civil disobedience, but it's Gene Sharp, he has 198 different methods of nonviolent action. It's, it's uh, the way I mean, that like the thing that I'm talking about. Is voting nonviolence or? Is what? Voting or? Like, what does that entail exactly, nonviolence? It's, it's an act of resistance. It could be standing out here with a poster, it could be blocking the door there, but it's an intentional use of 
using some nonviolent tactic as a form of resistance. I wouldn't say voting is. Yeah. I think maybe this is another on Occupy Oakland there was a discussion <laughs> about an incident where between five and ten people showed up with shields and trying to line themselves up five feet from the cops. So if you have a shield, is that nonviolent? There's um with the mar with with the most recent types of movements there's a very like long debate and kind of uh, hard debate to work out of what is violent and what is nonviolent. There's some people up in Oakland today it happened, the black block people, the, the, anarchists, the anarchists who think that you can that property is violent, so if you destroy property then that's not non that's not violence. It's okay to do it. But what happens is the black block people come in and do it in the middle of a nonviolent protest to defend themselves. They don't go do it on their own when there isn't a lot of exactly. nonviolent people around that they do it when nonviolent people have a protest, they've worked out all their programs, they've worked out what their agreement is of how we're gonna to be together, and then the black block anarchist people come out and they'll smash the windows and they'll provoke the police to basically attack the nonviolent protesters. So I think they're a bunch of cowards myself um, because they're doing something under the cover of nonviolent protesters. they do that? I mean, I think clearly it doesn't make sense to a lot of people, otherwise they wouldn't do it. So why is it that this small group, I mean, what are they trying to do? They're trying to be radical. They want to show how how strong they are and that they hate, they hate capitalism or something like that. They're showing their extreme expression of dissent. But it's a... Um, I think they think they're right? Yeah. In their the, minds? Yeah. The thing, they want to be radical. They want to be on the edge of resistance but the problem is it the problem is is that what they do they don't do it on their own the only time they come out and smash windows is when they're nonviolent when there's a nonviolent protest to protect them and what they end up doing is getting a lot of people hurt who hadn't signed on to do anything like that so I think if they want to go smash windows they can go do it the next day <laughs> call a black block action and go out and fight the police that they have the right to do that, but when they come out and mess with the nonviolent movement, it's real. I think it's really wrong. Yeah, I've never heard of them basically doing it on their own. They always yeah. go follow some like normal protest movement that was planned by people who are not for that, and they always just trail along behind yeah. and look for the cops, start throwing stuff at them. Yeah, and I still don't get an answer to my question. Maybe it's not answered. But I'm just curious from that discussion. It's like. Um, I've got a helmet I can wear, right? But is that... You know, but I'm picturing being, you know, back with the rest of the crew, not being five yards in front of a cop. You know, is... At what point, I guess, does provocation with props cross that line of nonviolence? Or is, or is that even answerable? I mean, are there so many other invulnerables? The, the way that it... The way that that works from my experience is that within a protest movement, the people who are in the protest movement decide what is acceptable and what isn't. That's what everyone agrees to. You have big giant meetings. Yeah. We, in 1983, we were up at Livermore and we had a thousand people that got arrested up there. And before that, we had months of meetings where we, we'd have what they called, the structure they had was affinity groups where people who have, who've been trained together or people who have something in common they would meet and send representatives to a decision-making meeting, and that's what we talked about at the meeting. And it took a really long time to work it out. And but what what happens in the meeting is the group agrees to what what the nonviolent standards are for the for the protests. And so if you're going to be a part of this, then this is what your standards are. If you're going to, that would be something that you'd bring up to the group, hopefully, and say, "We want to do this. Is this acceptable to the group?" And so the group okay, decides. So there's no stock answers. There's a stock no, process. It's within within whatever the conflict is. But, but legally, there might be something saying you can't use a shield, right? Because I mean, you could use a shield as a weapon. Um, no. I just, well, it depends on the shield. I, I, I point I know, of information. I <laughs> Here, uh, I've heard that in some cities they they have a limit to how big the stick can be. Uh, when you have your poster, they say it can oh, only be yeah. like a quarter inch. Now take that to an extreme. I was at a rally out at De Anza College, a Reagan uh, uh, game, and there was a guy with a baseball bat and sandwiched on the outsides of it was some signs, right? And he had a helmet on and he was inebriated. 
<laughs> so you know, you use your own judgment. You know what? Yeah, you know, they consider it props if they can be used as weapons, or will it serve more of a theatrical purpose for the education of the public? Personally, I think a shield is kind of heavy. Can be considered. Hey, you might want to whack somebody. You know, so that but that complaint can be brought up to the group at large. People can decide yeah. what they want to. So the use answer is like basically it's, it's not a stock answer. It's a process right. answer. Yeah, and th this issue is. What I, and all the big protests that are happening, I'm sure that up in Oakland when they were pro planning for today, there's a lot of conversation about what was acceptable and what wasn't. So it happened, and that's what a lot of the discussion is in, the, in these protests before like planning is what is and what isn't acceptable. It just seems like if people showed up with shields, you might have some people that would want to push it a little bit further, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. If I did a protest, I'd probably say days. no shields because uh, somebody would want to just do something from behind, you know. So I, yeah, I part didn't... of it these days is also that some people know what they can do with it, and other people just think it's something to put on your arm and hold out, and that can create a problem. Yeah, and the reality is, is that um, during the '80s and '90s, and probably now. What happens is the police or whoever you're protesting against, they have people that they send into your group, and their job basically is to get you to be violent. They're the one, and a lot of times they're the ones that are saying, let's get the guns, let's do this, let's do that, basically because it's a lot easier for the police or the whatever group that you're up against, it's a lot easier for them to respond to violence. They're not used to, they don't have a plan to respond to nonviolence. Um, as you saw up in Oakland, the, the mayor of Oakland is someone who was, used to be an activist. And she was, she had this thing that she had to do. She called the police out, and she's like in this really interesting position right now because of what she ended up doing. Um, on the last page, just to kind of wrap it up, um, there's a really interesting study that was done. It's the third point down there. Um, of 323... Uh, changed campaigns throughout the world between 1899 and 2006 um, called Why Civil Resistance Works. Um, and what they found was that 50 53% of the nonviolent campaigns and 26% of the violent campaigns were either successful totally or had some level of success. So what this study, this is a, th a study from acad acad academicians that showed that nonviolence actually has been more effective, twice as effective as violent struggle, as armed struggle. So this, that's an important study, but I don't, I don't think there's been a whole lot of newspaper or media coverage of that study. Um, and then finally, the thing that I think is most important, uh, we live in a relatively free society and we have the ability to develop nonviolence to its furthest extent because we have the freedom to do it. And I, I think we're going to find out now, once this gets rolling along, what how violent our society really is. Uh, because our society at its core is a very violent society. And when it's challenged, especially the core values that we're challenging here in this movement, um, I think we're going to see how violent our society is. But it's right now we need to get a lot of people to understand this stuff so that when, when we start building a movement it's based on understanding of how change happens and um, how nonviolence works because this is really the only way that we're gonna achieve anything um, I'll just finish this I have a website here called people have the power info and I'm gonna be putting notes for this workshop up there and some other things and it's a blog that I was doing for a while and it's going to have a lot of information about nonviolence up there. Um, one of the uh, visions, or I don't, I don't know, I, I guess a vision that I have is um, one of the tools that we used when I was learning how to become a, a nonviolent organizer was we used a tool called the strategy game. And what it is is that you set a scenario, let's say like the lunch counter sit-ins during the civil rights movement, and you have different people who play the different roles so you have like the mayor and the police and the, the sit-in people and the lunch, the people who own the restaurants and the bystanders and stuff. And you have different, and what you do is you set the scenario up and then the people have to respond in, in stages. So you have the first sit-in and then they respond this way. And then the next time that you meet or then you take time to meet again and you figure out what your strategy is gonna be next. So the police figure out their strategy, the protesters figure out their strategy and everyone comes together again and you basically talk about what you're going to do and then that 
then the the game keeps moving along until you reach the end point of what happens at the end. But it's a way of, for people to experience thinking about how nonviolence works. And what your one of the basic tools we used during nonviolence training was uh, basically role playing, where people were police and people got used to getting beat up and all that kind of stuff. What? But this is what I want to I want to develop this, and what my vision is is to develop it on the internet and use it as a tool where people come together and learn how to use nonviolence st strategically and build the power of nonviolence basically on the internet before you go out and enact it. So you use strategy games first, and then you test them out in reality, and then you come back and kind of go back and forth uh, and develop strategy that way. Um, so that's, like that's my plan. Yeah, as a way of like trying something before you go out and do it. Mm -hmm. At least and reporting how it works. Yeah, and then you then you tweak the strategy and you and you come back and learn. Um, so that's my workshop. Thank you. So do you guys have questions or comments or? I have a question. Yeah. Um, I I I can't yeah. figure it out. Why? Especially nowadays, like cameras and cell phones, like I don't understand how some police officers can do the things that they do. I mean, you know, and they're not like directly physically threatened. I, how is it that they, I mean, is it like a psychological thing? You know, they're, you know, something biologically happens, you know, they just get worked up and then they just kind of lose it or... Um, I think they're trained to do, to think in a certain way. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, something sets them off and it, they just react and in just, a certain way. Yeah. kind of snowballs from there. Yeah, and just some of them are violent. And, uh -huh. you know, you're going to respond using violence, you know, when you get the chance, if that's kind of why you became a police officer uh -huh. for those rare opportunities when you get to do something like that. But it's kind of their training and they're. Our whole system, if you kind of understand, our, our system is built on using violence when the time comes to using violence to, wow. achieve, to coerce people into doing what you want them to do. So they already know that they, got, they do have a green light to an extent at some point. Yeah. And they get it and they go and... Yeah. Just going to comment on that. Uh, studied, my dad was in the Navy and studied a lot of military history. A lot of that should see the gun in the but cops military tactics, but they have none of the command and control that goes with it. They are not 